wife and I are high school sweethearts. When we met, I was working at a funeral home. It just started as a summer job, and it turned into something that I never thought I'd leave. And God used that, though, to teach me things that still affect who I am and how I work today. I became an apprentice mortician. I learned to embalm, and as low man on a totem pole, I embalmed a lot. <laughs> but not one complaint. <laughs> The record still stands. <laughs> it, so way off. The, <laughs> it's fun to tell your people when they're there and say, you know, if this goes really bad, I'm still your guy. <laughs> or if you want me to help fix your hair or makeup, just, just be very, very still. <laughs> That also meant that I was in an awful lot of hospital rooms and a lot of homes at a difficult time in people's lives. And I learned firsthand what genuine kindness and care did for people and how much they truly appreciate that. I learned the importance of doing the right thing when no one was watching. That served me incredibly well working narcotics and still as a pastor because you spend a lot of time alone. There was a plaque on the prep room that said, this body is the most precious possession of their family. Treat it as though they were in the room with you, and we did. I saw the importance of the good reputation that the owner had in the community. It was incredibly important for him to remember people's names and to greet them by name no matter where he was. I learned the importance of a professional image, whether we were washing the cars or meeting with families or mowing the lawn. I never thought I would do anything different, but we had a little one on the way, and I needed insurance and a little more money, and that's how I ended up at the Sheriff's Department, a whole new world. I started as a deputy working in the jail, and that taught me a whole bunch of other things about working with people, and how often the inmates were much easier to work with than my coworkers. I learned there was going to be an opening in their narcotics unit. We didn't hardly know anything about it, and that's what made it so cool. You know, when you don't know what you don't know, it seems so much better. It was secretive. The guys would sneak in and sneak out, and nobody knew where their office was. We heard stories that were probably exaggerated. But if you were selected for the narcotics unit, they sent you through police academy, and that would give me something I didn't have. It seemed like that would make the risks worth the gamble, but someone told my wife that the guys who go into the unit come out either dead or divorced or a whole bunch worse off. So she said no. I applied anyway and didn't tell her. I thought, well, I'd, chances that I would get it were slim, and I thought the interview process would be a good experience. And a few weeks later, I went in on my night shift, and there in the basket was a note, Deputy Rose, now you've been reassigned as detective to the narcotics unit, report to the commander. Talk about an odd, do you know what moment. <laughs> what in the world am I going to tell my wife? I had eight hours to think about it. Well, the next morning, that went well. <laughs> At the end of it, we agreed that I would fulfill the two-year commitment if God would keep me alive and not a day longer. She said, I did not sign up to raise our little girl without her daddy. And I did the whole long hair, beard thing to change my appearance. And I was immersed in undercover work. I worked 24-7. I promised my wife I was going to take New Year's Eve off and I'd take her out for dinner with another couple. We never did anything together. We couldn't be seen together for my family's safety. So we were going to go out of town with another couple, but my beeper went off. And it was a really bad guy that I had met months earlier, but would be a real trophy. Either this was a setup, or he was desperate for cash. I called the office and I asked him to put the team together. And I promised my wife, I'll be right back. <laughs> Stay dressed up. I'll be back in just a little bit. 
I tucked my pistol under my seat on my way to meet him, and I asked, does anybody hear me? To see if my body mic was working, and somebody flashed their headlights, so I knew somebody could. I was trying to get my mind straight, make sure I was all in the zone for what I was about to do, and a 19-year-old came off the freeway and said he lost his brakes. He was doing over 60, I was doing over 50, and he hit me head on as I drove by the road below. He hit me so hard that it lifted my Monte Carlo completely off the road and spun me 180 degrees. And I got hit by a pickup truck head on when I landed. I bent the steering wheel, I bubbled the windshield with my head, and when it was all done, I was crumpled up underneath the dashboard. I had so much glass in my face, I thought I was laying on a road in a pile of gravel. I couldn't breathe. I felt myself filling up with fluid, and I knew that's bad. My partners came and were looking for my pistol, looking for my ID. They were just in shock. They were still worried about not blowing my cover. And I heard my partner say to the commander that he'll call dispatch and have him send a squad car to take my wife to the hospital. He said, have him bring her here. And he leaned into the car and he said, hang on, bud. We're getting your wife. And I tried to whisper, tell her I love her. And I'm sorry. And then I prayed. With the clearest mind I have ever had in my life. Dear Lord, I am so sorry for everything. I didn't see any bright lights, didn't hear any voices, but I had a peace that no words can describe. They got me to the hospital. They brought in my wife. She ran out. The doctor said, where's his daughter? Somebody go get his daughter. And I asked the doc, am I going to make it? And he said, you're hurt real bad, but I'm doing everything I can for you. We've got a helicopter coming. I'm not going to give you anything for the pain. If you want to help me, the best thing you can do is stay awake. You know, to this day, I don't want to fall asleep. <laughs> I went back to the hard and the fast of the unit, almost like I was indestructible. A couple of years later, I got hurt again. I had a bunch of surgeries, got some new parts. After a long recovery, went back to the unit. A couple of years later, I was in again, this time for more than three weeks. That one almost did me in. <laughs> you know, after a few things like that, you start to wonder, Lord, what do you have in mind? <laughs> Should I be doing something different? <laughs> well, those two years turned into almost seven years in the unit before I was promoted to detective sergeant. I was transferred to the bureau to work homicide, violent crime. And as crazy as that might sound, my hours improved. <laughs> unless, of course, things were happening. At the same time, our, our church needed help with the Sunday school program, so I started doing the little service at the start of Sunday school. I did a little devotion, and then the kids would all go off to their separate classrooms, and parents started to stay as they dropped their kids off. And the Lord started to bless the attendants, and the parents would say, why don't you go be a pastor? <laughs> it's not me. Maybe when I retire. And the pastors said, Dave, why don't you consider maybe being a pastor? And I said, no, it's not for me. Maybe when I retire. And that went on for three or four years. And I was preparing for a Sunday school teacher's meeting. And I looked off to my wife. I said, you know, some guy's doing this, and 
He's not feeling like he has to learn the whole Bible, terrified that somebody's going to ask him a question he doesn't know. But he hasn't been away from his family for the last two weeks straight working homicides. She said, if you want to, you could too. I was walking back to my car after work in a grisly scene, and a pastor had come out to meet with a family, and he was walking back with me. His car was parked next to mine. He said, Detective, I don't know anything about you, but I think you should be doing what I'm doing. I said, no, <laughs> that's not for me. Maybe when I retire. I came home in the middle of the night, three or four in the morning, I got a beer in my Bible. Who doesn't do that? <laughs> Some things still don't change. <laughs> and I wasn't looking to read anything in particular. I ended up reading in James, you know, my paraphrase. Well, look at you. You're going to go do this, and you're going to go do that, and it's going to be for this long your life's a mist, vanishes, and you're gone. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll do this or that. And I prayed every day, Lord, what's your will? We visited Martin Luther College and met with a second career committee. We met with a couple of other second career students. I went to a Deutschlander class. We went to chapel. Deutschlander was preaching. The women's choir sang. I couldn't believe that this, this was somebody's day. <laughs> when we got home, I told my wife, I don't want to talk about it. And the next morning, I said, I am so glad we finally did that because now I know I will never be a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Before we left MLC, one man, and I know where he lives, <laughs> said, I don't give my opinions when guys come like this because if this doesn't work out, you've walked away from everything and I still have a job. But I think you need to be here. I couldn't get that out of my head. So I got a copy of the Augsburg Confession and I said, I'm gonna find reasons why I've got the wrong church all along and then my struggle's over. But as I read it, it had the exact opposite effect. God had brought me through so much that he did not have to. Would I make it through the next one? Because there would be. And I'd gotten to work every kind of case I'd ever hoped to. It wasn't anything I wished I could have done that I didn't do. So I called my pastor. And I told him that this was eating me alive sitting in lawn chairs in his backyard. I said, I have been praying for the Lord's will to be done, and he is not telling me anything. He said, Dave, I love you and your family, and I don't want to lose my fishing buddy. But God's going to keep after you until you go. Sitting in my office in the detective bureau, looking at all the stuff on the walls, I wondered, what happens if I call this the first half of my life and call it good? And what do I have to lose? Lord, if you'll have me, if I spend the rest of my life serving you. <laughs>